I'm uh, Raimond Simonovskis, and I come from far, far away from Latvia. Where is Latvia? Well, that was the question that was asked by many Americans three years ago <laughs> during London Olympic Games when a uh, U.S. beach volleyball team was knocked out by a Latvian team. And then there were many questions on Twitter. Uh, so these are uh, Latvian guys. There were many questions on Twitter. Where is Latvia? Do they even have beaches? So I thought they had just vampires and castles and stuff. <laughs> well, therefore, I wanted to start with a short geography lesson. So at first, according to some movies, Vampires live here, <laughs> but Latvia is located uh, across the Atlantic Ocean in North uh, East uh, Europe. You see there. Well, according to some other movies, uh, uh, this uh, vampire stuff originated in Transylvania, but that's more to the south of the Europe. That's not us. But we have a 500 kilometers long beach. Yeah. And if you didn't know it, so it's 310.686 miles. Uh, so we have a lot of beaches, so therefore beware of Latvians when we play beach volleyball. <laughs> okay, now back to our topic, data warehouses and multidimensional data analysis. Uh, imagine we are building a Rails application which will track product sales to our customers. And uh, we have uh, several models in our Rails application, like customers, which have uh, many orders. Uh, then uh, each order uh, is placed on a particular date and can contain uh, several order items. Each order item contains the price and quantity of the product that was bought. And uh, products also belong to product classes. So this is our uh, simple uh, Rails application. And we went also to the last talk and learned that, well, we should use Postgres SQL. So therefore, we designed and stored everything in uh, Postgres. And this is our database schema with customers, orders, order item, products, and product classes tables. And so we are proud Rails developer. We made our good looking uh, Rails application. But then one day, our CEO called us and asked us a question. Uh, well, uh, what were the total sales amounts in California in Q1 last year by product families? Uh, okay, we'll find it out. So let's look at our database schema. So where do we store amounts? Okay, we have order items table. There we have a amount column. Okay, we should probably start with that one. Uh, and uh, well, we don't, we like Rails conventions. We will write everything in Ruby. So we start with order item, some amount. Now uh, the next question is in California, where we do have this geography. Okay, geography we do have in customers table. Therefore, we need to join to order items orders table, join customers, and add condition that customers country is USA, state is California. Now uh, in Q1 2014, so where we do have this time information, it's order date in our orders table. Uh, we have already orders uh, table joined. Uh, we need to put condition. So we could translate this condition to that date is between 1st of January and 31st of March. But we would like to stick to the original criteria, and therefore we will extract the year from the date and extract the quarter from the date. And we'll use uh, Postgres specific functions for that. And we'll limit that's 2004 first quarter. And finally, we need to do it by product families, which means that now we need to join also products, uh, product classes, uh, and then group by product family and get the uh, sum of that. So we finally uh, got the, uh, the answer. So it's uh, probably not the shortest uh, query in Rails. And we can take a look that this was what we uh, uh, wrote in Ruby. So this is generated SQL, so probably we wrote it a little bit shorter, but not much, but well, we could also do it directly in SQL. And we presented a result to our CEO. And then he asked the next question, but also sales cost. Uh, well, we could write a separate query, but this won't be so performant. Therefore, we'll modify our query. Unfortunately, in uh, Rails, uh, uh, this, uh, relations, we can't make a sum of several columns, therefore we need to write some tricky stuff, yes, select explicitly product families, 
uh, and then sum of sales amounts, sales of cost, and then map it just to non-empty attributes. Uh, okay, but then uh, our CEO continues to ask questions, and unique customers count. Okay, we can uh, add also count of distinct customers ID and re return that as well. Uh, but we start to, a little bit to worry that, so these are kind of ad hoc questions and we will need, well, each 15 minutes our CEO will call us and we'll need to write some new query. It would be better if we could somehow teach users to write these queries by themselves. So we, we once tried it uh, and so explained so how easy it is to write everything in Rails console. <laughs> Yeah, and get the result, yeah. But um, unfortunately, our business users so didn't understand that, and well, so something's not quite, quite good there. As well as uh, our business is doing pretty well, and uh, the amount of orders and order items is growing, and we notice that uh, when we need to do some aggregated queries on large data volumes, for example, well, we tested, we copied some production database to our local computer, and we got some six million uh, lines in order items table, and if we didn't add any conditions, I just wanted to aggregate uh, sales amount, sales cost, and uh, number of unique customers, it took 25 seconds uh, to do that, so which is um, not quite uh, good for ad hoc queries. Well, then we asked some uh, consultants, uh, so what to do, and then uh, some consultants came and told that, well, SQL is bad, yeah? <laughs> you should use no SQL, yeah? or introduce some Hadoop cluster and write uh, MapReduce jobs in JavaScript, which will calculate everything you need. Well, probably also not the, uh, we still like SQL, and uh, so probably we shouldn't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, return to some classics. Uh, and there already 20 years ago, there was one, uh, the first edition of this book was written, The Data Warehouse Toolkit, by Ralph Kimball. So I would definitely recommend anyone. Uh, so it's now already third edition, anyone interested in the topic, so to read this book. About, and this uh, book talks about dimensional modeling. And uh, what are the main objectives of the dimensional modeling? I'm quoting this book. Uh, so we need to, to deliver data that's understandable and usable uh, to the business users, as well as we need to uh, deliver fast query performance. And uh, how we do this dimensional modeling? So uh, in, in, when doing dimensional modeling, so we need to identify, so which are these terms that uh, we see in these business questions, uh, these analytical questions, and model our data structures based on that. So let's uh, look again at this uh, question. What were the total sales amounts in California in Q1 2014 by product families? So the first thing we will always notice, there will be some these so-called facts or measures. These are some numeric measures that we will like to aggregate by some other dimensions. And uh, yeah, and by other dimensions, which means which we can identify in these questions. So we have California, which is kind of customer or region dimension. Then we see some time dimension, and we see some product dimension or product family dimension. So when uh, just uh, talking with our business users, we can identify which are these facts, which are these dimensions that we would need to use. And uh, uh, these data modeling techniques and data warehouse uh, techniques suggest that we model our so-called data warehouse, where we'll store the data but are organized according to these uh, uh, dimensions and facts that we see in these queries. And the typical uh, database schema that is used for that is so-called star schema, uh, because uh, most often that, uh, we will see one table in the center and then a lot of tables uh, uh, with foreign keys linked to this uh, central table, and therefore it looks like a star. And uh, these are these factor and dimension tables, so let's start from the center. This will be this fact table, uh, so we are using naming convention that will use this F uh, prefix for that, uh, for sales data. And always the fact table will contain foreign keys to uh, other dimensions like customer ID, product ID, time ID, uh, and then the uh, measures, numeric measures we would like to analyze like sales quantity, amount, and cost. And then it's linked to the uh, dimension tables. We will use this naming convention, uh, uh, start with D prefix for them. And we see that uh, this is customer's uh, dimension where we see all the customer's attributes. And then there are some special dimensions like time dimension. So instead of uh, extracting some year or quarter dynamically during our queries, we want to pre-calculate them. 
And therefore, we'll, for each date that will appear for our sales facts, we'll pre-calculate and store corresponding time dimension record. We'll have some time ID, as well as uh, pre-calculated, which is this year, quarter, months, uh, both as integers, as well as, uh, as strings, which could be represented to, to users, how we want to represent, for example, quarter name or month name, etc. And sometimes uh, we don't have simple star schemas, sometimes we have these so-called snowflake schemas, that some dimensions like uh, customer, uh, like products in our case, are linked further to some, uh, some classes or categories dimension, like product uh, classes in this case. And if we have a lot of these uh, ones, uh, then our database schema starts to look like unique snowflake. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so we will store these uh, star schema in a separate database schema, uh, or uh, uh, it could be even separate database uh, if we want to uh, put for performance reasons, and how we would manage it from our Rails application. So we create corresponding Rails uh, models uh, on, on top of these uh, fact and dimension tables. We would have sales, fact, uh, customer dimension, time dimension, product dimension, etc. And as these are separate uh, database schema, we need to regularly populate this uh, data warehouse schema with the data from our uh, uh, transactional data. And the simplest case would be that we just could regularly uh, repopulate the whole database schema, like truncate existing, for example, customer's uh, uh, table, and then do select uh, from our transactional schema and insert all the necessary uh, fields in our dimension table. Or in case of uh, time dimension, so we need to dynamically generate it. So we need to uh, select what are all the unique order dates, in our case, which appear. And then we uh, pre-calculate which year, quarter, month uh, they be belong. And uh, we store these uh, pre-calculated values in our uh, uh, time dimension table. And uh, finally, we need to load the facts. And in, in this case, uh, we... Uh, select the data we, uh, from orders and order items table and extract uh, the sales quantity, sales amount, sales cost, and store corresponding uh, foreign key values uh, to our dimension tables. So one thing, uh, uh, what, what we can see uh, there, that to simplify uh, time dimension ID generation, we are using convention that we will generate time ID as uh, four year digits, then two month digits, and two date digits, so that it's, we always uh, understand what the time ID refers to. Now, uh, if we return to the original question and how we would uh, solve that, so now all our queries will be more standardized so that we always start from the sales fact table and then we join the uh, corresponding necessary dimensions like customers, products, product classes, time, and we uh, specify conditions on the dimension tables that we want just USA, California, uh, year 2004, quarter one, and uh, group by product families and get the sum. So probably it wasn't a much shorter syntax, but at least it is more standardized than uh, we always know how to uh, approach these analytical queries. But still, uh, we probably wouldn't teach our users to write these queries directly. And we are still limiting us to this two-dimensional table models, uh, model. So we want to, uh, to store everything in this standard two-dimensional tables. But uh, much better abstraction for these analytical queries is multidimensional data model. So let's imagine that we have a multidimensional data cube. So probably we can imagine three dimensions, but let's imagine that you can imagine multidimensional data cubes with arbitrary amount of uh, dimensions. And then in this intersection of dimension uh, values, we store measures. Uh, which correspond to particular uh, dimension values. Like in our case, we have, uh, imagine we have sales cube with customer, product, and time dimensions, and then in, the, in intersection for each particular customer, product, time uh, period, we store what was the sales quantity, sales amount, sales cost, and unique customers count for that. And there are technologies that, oh, well, uh, at first, uh, in each of these uh, dimension, uh, some dimensions might be just detailed list of values, but some other dimensions could have hierarchies with uh, several hierarchy levels. Like, for example, in customer's dimension case, 
in addition to detailed customers level, we have uh, all customers together, then we uh, can expand them to individual countries, then countries to states, then states to cities, then cities to individual customers. Or in case of time dimension, we could have even several hierarchies. Maybe sometimes we want to make the reporting, we start by year, quarter, month, and individual day. And sometimes we want to make weekly reporting. And then the same dates, we can group together by weeks, and then by years where uh, they belong to. And uh, there are special technologies that are better uh, suited and which use this uh, multi-dimensional data model. And uh, so they are typically are called OLAP technologies, where OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing, uh, vice versa, traditional OLTP systems, which are online transaction processing. So these, are, these uh, technologies concentrate more on how to do efficiently analytical queries. And there are several commercial uh, uh, technologies for that, but uh, as well as open source technologies, and one of the most popular open source uh, OLAP uh, engine is uh, uh, Mondrian engine by Pentaho. And that's a Java library, and where you need to uh, write XML, so to define some data schemas. Well, we Rubies don't like Java and XML so much. So therefore, a couple of years ago, I created a Mondrian OLAP gem, uh, which is JRuby gem, which embeds uh, Mondrian OLAP Java engine and creates nice Ruby DSL around it so that you can uh, use it from plain Ruby. So how, uh, let's introduce this Mondrian OLAP in our application. So the first thing that we need to define is this uh, Mondrian schema where we do the mapping of these dimensions and uh, measures that uh, our users will use and which represent these business terms. And we need to map them to the fact and dimension tables and columns where the data are stored. So let's look at examples. So we uh, define sales cube, uh, and the sales cube will use this uh, facts table, F underscore sales. Then we have uh, uh, defined our dimensions. So we define we have customer dimension with this foreign key. It will be using uh, the D customers uh, uh, table in the data warehouse schema, and we specify wh which are all these levels that we want to use in this uh, dimension and in which uh, particular columns they are stored. As well as we define product dimension and uh, time dimension as well. And then uh, finally, we also describe which will be these measures that we will uh, use in our schema, like sales quantity, sales amount, sales cost, which use uh, sum as aggregator, but then we have customer's count uh, measure, which will uh, do the distinct count on a customer's ID uh, in a sales fact table to get the unique count of customers for a particular uh, query. And there we use a different aggregator. So, and now when we look on the same question and how we could get the result using Mondrian OLAP, so it's very simple and nice. So as we, uh, if we look at this, so, so it's a minimum, uh, uh, it directly translates the question to our query. We uh, tell that from sales cube, on columns, we uh, want to put, uh, as column heading, we want to put sales amount. On rows, we want to put all product families. We take from product family level all members. And we put this uh, limitation filter that we want to filter just from customer's dimension, USA, California, and from time dimension, take quarter, uh, quarter one, uh, 2014. And we get the, uh, the result. So we don't have any technical implementation details which are uh, hidden and created one, once in this uh, Mondrian schema definition. And uh, Mondrian Engine, as uh, several others, are you internally are using this MDX query language, which is one of the most uh, popular query languages for these OLAP tools, which looks a little bit similar to SQL, but not quite. Uh, and uh, Mondrian OLAP uh, JRuby Jamia does the translation from this query builder syntax to the MDX query language, uh, so which will be executed. And as a result, we get the 
results object where we can query and get, so what are our uh, column headings, what are our row headings, and what are the cell values, uh, what we are getting there. Uh, several other benefits of, of uh, this Mondrian engine is that, uh, so w when we'll execute uh, some large uh, MDX query where we do not uh, do any filtering, and again, I tested it on some six million rows and fact table. So initial uh, query also for large query will take some 21 seconds. But when we execute the same query second time, it executes in 10 milliseconds. Because Mondrian Engine does uh, caching of the results in this multidimensional data cube model, and it doesn't uh, do caching of uh, these queries, it caches the actual results. That when we do the new query, we, uh, it analyzes, okay, we have already these data cached in these uh, cells, these uh, data cube cells. We don't have these ones. For these ones, I generate a corresponding SQL statement to populate the data. And as in these uh, analytical uh, solutions, uh, we don't uh, need very up-to-date uh, information up to the latest second. So we typically just regularly populate our data warehouse uh, schema with the data. And then while it's populated, so it can cache all the results. And if many users are asking the same thing, so results will be very fast. Additional benefits are that uh, now we can much easier to introduce additional dimensions based on additional data attributes that we need. For example, in a customer's table, we had a gender column, which stored F or M as uh, values uh, for a female or male. And we, we want to add uh, to our schema additional gender dimension. And we can uh, easily uh, create a new gender dimension map to customer's table to gender column. In addition, uh, so for users, we want to decode that F means female, M means male, and we can put this name expression, which will be used uh, for generating these names of these dimension numbers. Or we can, uh, and then we can use this uh, dimension in the same way as we uh, used in uh, any others uh, and, uh, in our queries. Uh, in addition, we can do even more advanced uh, dynamic attribute dimensions. For example, we have a birth date for uh, our customers, and we would like to uh, analyze uh, sales by uh, a customer age and split it to them into several intervals, for example, less than 20 years, 20 to 30 years, 30 to 40, etc. And But we have a birth date, so we need to calculate it dynamically. This we can also uh, define a new age interval dimension uh, where we once can uh, specify this more complex expression so that we uh, put there this SQL expression which will dynamically calculate the difference between birth date and current date and then uh, based on this interval it will output either uh, some less than 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years, etc as well as we dynamically generate the new dimension with these uh, values. And whenever yeah, we uh, make the query, so we, 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 we can, uh, it, it will be up to date based on um, uh, what is the current time. And uh, finally, uh, one of the benefits of uh, this modern engine is that we can make also calculation formulas uh, like uh, we can make these calculated measures, for example, like profit, which is sales amount mi minus sales cost, or uh, uh, margin in percentage, which is profit divided by sales amount, and we can specify format string that it should use percentage formatting. And as a result, yeah, we can query uh, these calculated measures in the same way as stored measures and get the results back and also properly formatted. And in these uh, MDX calculation formulas, so there's well, almost everything of what you can do in Excel, yeah, so there's corresponding function uh, in, in MDX for, uh, as well. So you can do a, a lot of uh, more advanced calculations there. And uh, as a result, yeah, these, uh, uh, this data model allows to create us also front, uh, better user interfaces and uh, for doing ad hoc queries by users. Uh, so this is, uh, as we don't want to always have to write uh, these by, by themselves, but then these objects, what we are using, are uh, the same as uh, cu customers are asking their uh, questions. And so this is just example from the Easy BI business intelligence applications that we are building, where we provide just graphical user interface where uh, users can move, okay, we want this dimension on columns, this dimension on rows, 
filter by these dimensions and then view results in table or, or in charts and, and format it. So uh, th this is, uh, data model is much better for doing these ad hoc queries. Okay, let's uh, switch to a couple of other topics. So we uh, discussed about uh, how to do the queries, but let's uh, come back to ETL process. So we talked about three-letter acronyms, SQL, MDX, so let's talk about uh, another uh, three-letter acronym, ETL, which means extract, transform, load. In the simplest case is what we looked, uh, maybe we can populate our data warehouse just from the operational tables, uh, transactional tables in our database. But uh, quite often we need many different data sources for our data warehouse. Uh, some are uh, stored in our uh, uh, transactional databases, some are coming from some external sources as CSV files or from REST API. And then this process, how we extract uh, this information from other sources, then we need to transform them, probably parse different uh, formats, data formats, uh, maybe uh, unify and standardize these data uh, to use the, the same primary foreign keys, etc. This is this transformation step. And finally, we populate and load uh, them into our data warehouse. So there are several uh, uh, Ruby tools for doing uh, this ETL. So one was uh, done by Square, named ETL gem. And I want to mention there's one new uh, gem, uh, Kiba, uh, which for doing um, this ETL process, which is oriented to the uh, row-based uh, 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 extraction, transformation, uh, and loading. So this is an example from the readme. But there you, you can make some reusable uh, methods that you do some data parsing, and then you define some source as a Ruby class and the source could be either CSV or database or something like that. And then you, in, uh, you can chain several transformations and describe in uh, this DSL how you would like to do the transformations. And finally, you would like to load the data into the database. Uh, but one more thing I wanted to tell that if you do complex transformations, then uh, unfortunately Ruby is not the fastest programming language. And if you need to process uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of rows, it might be slow. But uh, sometimes, well, if we still want to stick with Ruby, so maybe we should do it in parallel. And therefore, I, I recommend to take, for example, a look at a concurrent Ruby gem, which provides several abstractions. And one is, uh, which is very well suited for this multi-threaded ETL is uh, ThreadPool. Uh, uh, so ThreadPool is that we can create uh, some fixed or varying size thread pool, and we can push jobs to this uh, thread pool, and then when it's complete, so, so it, push, uh, it gives some uh, result, and so then it's, it's probably processed by the next thread pool, and which might uh, suit very well yeah, this uh, ETL process that we have some uh, data extraction thread pool. For example, if you fetch some uh, data from external REST APIs, it is much faster, if it's, for example, paginated REST API, it is much faster start to fetch all the pages already in parallel and not fetch page one by one, fetch the first page after the next one, etc. It will be much faster in terms of total clock time to start already, let's fetch in parallel first 10 pages, then the next 10 pages. So we can use thread pool there. Then if we need to do complex transformation of the data, so then we uh, can use the uh, in parallel threads uh, these uh, transformations. But there is one pro tip, so then please use JRuby, as JRuby can use all your processor cores. If you will try to do it in MRI, so then unfortunately in MRI, just one thread can run in parallel, okay? Or you will need to then to make several processes which run in parallel. Let, uh, let's look at a very one simple uh, example. Well, we initially looked at single-threaded ETL process where we selected unique dates from orders and then we insert it in our time dimension table. And, but let's make it multi-threaded uh, in uh, this example. So that initially we created an insert date pool uh, with some uh, fixed, as fixed thread pool with default size four. And then we select these, uh, all the unique dates, but then we push, uh, pose them to this uh, thread pool. And in this thread pool, we will do the date insertion. But please note also that uh, in that case, if you do in multiple threads, please always uh, do explicitly check out new connection from active record connection pool, as otherwise, if you uh, take new database connections, it will automatically fetch out the new uh, 
uh, database connections in new threads, but if you will not, not give it back, you will run out of uh, database connections. And uh, finally, yeah, we shut down and wait for termination. And uh, for example, in this simple case, I did some benchmark also locally, on, uh, and then I uh, managed to uh, reduce twice the total clock time for loading the data. But please also see and be aware that if you will start to increase this thread pool size even more, you might start to get worse results. Because in this case, we still are finally inserting all the data in the same Postgres uh, table, and then Postgres might start to do some locking and slow down the process if, if we try to do insertions in the same table from uh, too, too many parallel threads. So please do benchmark. So if you use JRuby, there are uh, good standard Java tools for that, like Visual VM or VM or Java Mission Control. And uh, yeah, regarding JRuby, you don't need to rewrite all your application in JRuby. You can use it just for your data warehouse project uh, where you uh, populate the data and then do the queries. And uh, finally, uh, I, I wanted to give a short overview of uh, traditional versus analytical relational databases. As, uh, the, so most of us, are, when we are working with SQL databases, so we think of these traditional databases which are optimized for transaction processing, like MySQL or Postgres or Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle. And they can deal with large tables, and, uh, but they are optimized for doing uh, small uh, transactions like inserting, updating, and selecting small set of results. But as we saw, uh, then if we try to do aggregations of millions of records, so they are not the best technology for that. And there are a different set of SQL relational databases, but which are uh, optimized for analytical processing. For example, there is uh, one of the pioneers where our open source database MonetDB there are several uh, commercial databases like HP Vertic or Infobrite, but uh, which have uh, also community additions uh, where you can uh, use them up to some uh, significant size of, of your data or with some limited features. As well as uh, yeah, if you are using Amazon Web Services, then uh, Amazon provides Amazon Redshift uh, database, which is also uh, this uh, SQL uh, analytical uh, database, but uh, optimized for analytical queries. And what is the main, uh, this magical trick that uh, these databases are using for these analytical queries? So they m mostly use different data storage, uh, how they store the data. If we look at the traditional databases, they mostly use row-based storage, which means if we have table and row in a table, then physically on the database, so this, all these columns from this row are stored together in one of these file blocks. And when we need to, for example, to do a sum of some uh, numeric amount, as we saw, let's do sum of cells amount, then it will need to read practically all our database table because so we need to pick a sales amount from here, from here, from here, from here. And therefore, that's slow. And so the, what uh, most of these analytical databases are doing, they are using columnar storage. From logical perspective, we are still using uh, it, them as tables with rows, but uh, uh, the physical storage is organized by columns. So like in, uh, in, in this case, so in this, uh, the same example, all uh, values in the same column will be stored together. Uh, the next set of columns will be stored together. And uh, what's the main benefit now? If we need to do sum of or count of some uh, column fr from all records, they are all stored together, and uh, we, we can read that much quicker. The other benefit is that, uh, especially in these uh, data warehouse sales fact tables, we have also a lot of repeating values. For example, these foreign keys or, uh, or, or if we store directly already some va values which are uh, repeating some classifying information. And then if they are all stored together, they could be compressed much more effectively. And therefore, yeah, these uh, analytical databases also do better compression of the uh, inserted data. But the major drawback is that 
the individual transactions when using uh, columnar storage will be much slower. If you will now will want to insert these rows one by one in these analytical databases, so it will be much slower than uh, in a traditional transactional databases or if you update one by one. Therefore, if you are using these columnar database, storage databases, analytical databases, you typically maybe prepare your date, what you would like to have there, and then you do bulk import of the whole table or the bulk import just of the changes, which will be then much uh, more efficient. And I made a also simple example on my local machine. Uh, as I said that I had uh, generated uh, the sales fact table with six million rows, and uh, I, I did uh, this query which just uh, does the aggregation of uh, sales amount, sales cost, and uh, distant count of uh, uh, customer ID uh, from more than uh, six million rows and grouped by product families. And on Postgres, so whenever I ran it, so it was approximately 18 seconds on my local machine. Then I, in virtual machine, installed uh, HP Vertica and uh, didn't do any specific uh, optimization configuration there. So the first query I ran, so it took about nine seconds because, well, it just uh, needed to load and cache the data in memory. But each repeated query took just 1.5 seconds. So with exactly the same data amount, so I got uh, 10 times faster performance. So in, in reality, probably you won't get uh, the 10 times better performance all the time, uh, but uh, in some uh, studies of real customer data, they quite often report some three to five uh, improvement on query speeds, uh, which are like this, aggregation by and group by queries. And uh, I, I did the testing also on Amazon Redshift and got similar results to that uh, with the same uh, data set. And uh, yeah, my very unsophisticated uh, recommendation, uh, uh, well, unscientific uh, recommendation, uh, when to consider what. So if you have less than a million rows in fact tables, so then you probably won't see any big difference. So if you get uh, 10 million, so then complex queries will be, get slower on Postgres uh, MySQL. Uh, and if it will be 100 million, so, so you won't be able uh, to manage these uh, aggregation queries in, in uh, realistic time. And so when you have yeah, already 10 million and more records in your fact table, then for analytical queries, you might need to consider these uh, analytical columnar databases. So short uh, recap what we did uh, cover. So problems with analytical queries using traditional approaches, dimensional modeling, star schemas, small and all up and MDX, ETL, and analytical columnar databases. And thank you very much for attention. And you can uh, see uh, the f all these examples I posted on GitHub, uh, my RSIM profile. There is a sales app demo uh, application. So you can find it there, what I showed it. And then later also all my slides will be published. And thank you very much. And I have some two minutes for questions still. Thank you. Mm -hmm.